wonderful. Thanks to everyone who's joining our event today. We have a great event planned regarding um, vaccine mandates, a hot topic. I'm Elizabeth Henry. I'm the president of the Georgetown Law School Federalist Society. And for those of you who may not have attended our events before, the Federalist Society is a organization of conservative and libertarian lawyers founded on the principles that the state exists to preserve freedom, that the separation of governmental powers is central to our constitution, and that it is emphatically the province and duty of the judiciary to say what the law is, not what it should be. Um, if you're interested in becoming a member of our chapter, you can go to bedsock.org slash join. It's only $5 for student members. Um, our next event will be Thursday, February 10th at 2 p.m., also on Zoom, featuring Mississippi Solicitor General Scott Stewart regarding the Dobbs versus Jackson Women's Health Organization case. Um, today's event is co-sponsored by the Food and Drug Law Journal and the editor-in-chief of the Food and Drug Law Journal, Courtney stone Mursky, who is a 3L here at Georgetown, will be moderating today's event. Courtney, I'll turn it over to you to introduce today's speakers. Great. Thank you, Elizabeth. Um, hi, everyone. Welcome. Um, we're very fortunate today. We have three experts here with us. Um, we have Professor Larry Gostin. He is a university professor in Georgetown School of Law, Medicine, and Public Health. He's the director of the O'Neill Institute for National and Global Health, and he, is, he has written many, many books on, on law and public health. Uh, Professor David Hyman is a medical doctor. He is the Scott K. Ginsburg Professor of Law and Health Policy here at Georgetown, and he also has prolifically published on health law, health regulation, and health financing. Um, we are also likely to have with us Janine Yunus today from the New Civil Liberties Alliance. She is a litigation counsel there. Um, and she had worked specifically on vaccine mandates. So welcome to all of you. Um, I'm glad to have you here today. So just to kind of review for everyone who isn't aware of the state of vaccine mandates, um, you know, there have been about five federal mandates and um, a number of state and local governments have also adopted mandates. Um, among the federal mandates, a number have faced court challenges. Um, one from the Center of, for Medicare and Medicaid Services, which is in effect, and that was upheld by the Supreme Court a couple of weeks ago. Um, there was one from OSHA, um, the Occupational uh, Safety and Health um, Agency that was stayed by SCOTUS a couple weeks ago. Um, we also have a federal contractor mandate, and there's a nationwide injunction against that one, a federal employee mandate also subject to a nationwide injunction right now, and a military mandate. That one's in effect, but there have been um, court-ordered exemptions for religious um, exemptions. So I'm going to turn it over now to each of our panelists to give a short opening statement, and um, and then we'll have some questions. So Professor Gostin, do you want to kick us off? Sure. Thank you very much. Um, I appreciate it, Courtney. Um, the um, and first, let me apologize for my low energy. I've had a really busy day, a lot of zooms and things that. Um, so this is the culmination of it, and then I've got to leave early for yet another um meetings it's been a quite a hectic day for me um you know i i um i think that uh obviously that vaccine mandates are are um you know lawful and ethical um uh, but i and normally i would kind of go into the reasons why but i think since i've only got five minutes i want to just say that i think that vaccine mandates should be supported by the Federalist Society. Um, and I think that the old Federalist Society, the ones with, you know, that really had the kind of traditional conservatism would support it. Um, because there's been, first of all, um, vaccine mandates go back um, over a century. Um, in fact, way before that, you know, George Washington, ordered the continental troops to be inoculated and there have been vaccine mandates for many years the supreme court has upheld it twice um, um but more importantly um there's always been a tradition conservative tradition that um you know while um the government has no um uh cause for interfering with self-regarding behavior um, that the government could and should uh, deal with externalities. Um, and infectious diseases were the quintessential example of an externality. Um, and uh, so the idea, so say if you take the OSHA mandate that you know 
uh, a, a lot of the conservative groups who were against. Basically, it was basically saying to somebody, you can't go into a crowded workspace um, unmasked and unvaccinated. And you get to choose. You can, you can, you can mask uh, and test or you can vaccinate. Um, and even that was uh, you know, thought to be um, uh, wrong. But it seems to me that it defies common sense that a conservative would say that it's all right to expose other people to an infectious disease that's potentially deadly in a crowded workspace um, that you uh, uh, that you know you know that would that would cause harm to others and, and probably would. And OSHA um, estimated that there would be um, uh, thousands of, of deaths avoided, um, which probably was a conservative estimate. Now I realize that um, most vaccine mandates have been at the state and local level, and that states and localities have absolutely the primary public health powers. Um, I think they should have those powers. They should exercise them. Every state has exercised it and currently does with childhood uh, immunizations. Um, and many states don't even grant a religious exemption, including very conservative states like Mississippi and West Virginia. Um, the federal government has limited power. I, you know, I tend to disagree with the Supreme Court um, in saying that uh, uh, the Occupational Safety and Health Act did not um, authorize this, but I think there's room for disagreement on that. And there's a lot of debate over the ma major questions doctrine, but the only real take home point that I want to say is, is that I think that, you know, we've lost the tradition, frankly, of, conser of, of traditional conservatism. Um, and I wish we had it back um, because it's something I admired. And I, and I've always admired the Federalist Society, I still do, um, because of, you know, the thoughtful and, you know, I disagree with much of what the Federalist Society stands for, but I respect the integrity and the intellectual rigor um, that that Federalist Society has brought to these kinds of questions. Um, so with that, um, I'll, that's about my five minutes and I'll turn it over, I guess, is, is it to you, Professor Hyman? Uh, I think so. Um, so uh, thanks, Larry. Larry and I actually co-authored a textbook on public health law and health law, and we had plenty of disagreements. Um, but today I'm thrilled to find myself the mushy moderate for the first time in my career. Um, Nothing and, wrong with that. I think being, you know, the middle way is a good way, said the Buddha. <laughs> well, not always. But <laughs> th those of you who took my course, How to Regulate, uh, including Courtney, will recognize a lot of what I'm going to say. Um, at the outset, I, I just want to say that I think it's unfortunate that these issues have become politicized. Uh, before I went to law school, I went to medical school. And before I went to medical school, I was a bench scientist working on viruses way back in the 1980s. Uh, and I can tell you that viruses don't have any politics and they don't care about your politics and they don't care about state borders for that matter. Um, they are evolutionarily tuned uh, to reproduce and spread. And I think it's important for us to keep that in mind when we're beating one another up about uh, what the appropriate policies are. Um, just a basic framework for thinking about this issue. I think the starting point uh, is autonomy or liberty. Adults get to make their own decisions about their life. Uh, it's a basic keep your hands to yourself rule. That's how we get informed consent in medicine and a whole bunch of other social policies. And unless something is explicitly prohibited, it's allowed. Now, there are obviously slightly different rules for kids. Um, you know, you, parents get lots of deference on their decisions as long as they're within the realm of debatable options. Adults can refuse blood transfusions for religious reasons or rely on faith healing, but they can't make their kids a martyr for the cause. That gets treated as medical neglect. We take custody of kids and we treat them. Uh, now, there are obviously reasons not to leave things well enough alone, uh, particularly externalities, which uh, Larry, uh, Professor Gostin has already mentioned, where one person's behavior can affect other people. Uh, common law nuisance, a chunk of environmental law, and a lot of public health law are tied to the issues of externalities particularly when the transaction costs are sufficiently high that people can't uh, voluntarily bargain 
uh, to get these things. And so we see the government using a range of tools to address externalities, including taxes, direct regulation, and outright prohibitions. Now, in the public health space, there are lots of soft restrictions, like kids who aren't vaccinated against the usual childhood illnesses can't go to public school in most states. That worked pretty well until vaccine resistance migrated from the far right to the whole foods left, thanks in part to Jenny McCarthy and Robert F. Kennedy, um, and a phony baloney scare about vaccines causing autism. Uh, mask mandates on airplanes and other interstate commerce, common carriers are sort of in the same ballpark, uh, but the outer boundary is set by quarantine of individuals, households, and even entire neighborhoods. And these have been repeatedly upheld by the courts. Now, depending on the circumstances, these interventions can either be sensible or stupid, but there isn't much doubt that they have a role to play in reducing morbidity and mortality, as long as the underlying facts justify them. Next, when the government's an employer or a payer, and Larry has already alluded to this, it can attach certain conditions, including requiring its employees to be vaccinated or observe certain requirements. Uh, in practice, the government often defers the determination of the criteria to accrediting organizations, but it still retains the right to specify them. Uh, you pays the piper calls the tune, but it can't make up these things on the fly. It needs legislative authorization and fair notice. And I think uh, with due respect to Larry, that was part of the problem uh, at a minimum with the OSHA mandate. Uh, and some people believe it was also a problem with the CMS mandate that was in fact upheld. Now, when the government isn't an employer or a payer, the rules kind of depend on the level of government. The states have plenary police power. The federal government has a much more limited set of authorized powers and cities and counties have the authority that the state delegates to them. So that means that attempts to impose broad-based vaccine mandates at the federal level are gonna face tough sledding even if there were extremely explicit statutory foundations for them, far more explicit than I think there was found in the OSHA case, certainly, but also in fairness in the CMS case. So I've got just a couple of seconds left. Let me make uh, two final points. First, even if vaccines are effective, and it certainly seems that they are, there's, I think, quite compelling evidence that they are, it does not follow that vaccine mandates will be effective at raising the level of vaccination. A lot's gonna depend on how they're framed, presented and enforced. Public health personnel have lost a huge amount of credibility among large chunks of the population because of the pervasive evidence of government failure in responding to the pandemic and lots of evidence of the recommendations being skewed by groupthink and progressive public health policy. Uh, I take that up in a piece you can download from SSRN.com. And then the last issue I want to make, because I know I'm over a minute, uh, is even if there was a case for universal mandatory vaccinations imposed at the state level to deal with communicable disease externalities while we were in the midst of the earlier rounds of variants, I think it's fair to look, think that we're in a very different situation now with Omicron, particularly given the large number of people who are already vaccinated or have caught and recovered from COVID. I think there's a very strong case for protection of the vulnerable, but a lot of what we're doing is hygiene theater. So let me stop there uh, and turn things over to Janine. Thank you so much. Uh, I agree with a lot of what uh, Professor Hyman said. Um, and also, uh, it's certainly I agree that it's unfortunate that this whole issue has been politicized. I, uh, I actually myself came from the left. I was a public defender in New York for a long time. My Twitter handle is lefty lockdown skeptic. Um, I, I uh, sort of have found myself on a very different side of things because I um, firmly believe that the government exceeded its uh, authority in violating people's civil liberties and implementing supposed COVID mitigation policies that have mostly failed. Um, they've failed sort of in practice, and they've also, as Professor Hyman uh, noted, have caused a, a huge um, breakdown in trust between the public and health authorities that I think will be detrimental for decades to come. Um, so I also want to begin by saying I think there's been a little bit of a um, an assumption that the vaccine stopped transmission, and that's sort of the broader public health rationale. 
uh, it, many studies show that the vaccines actually were never sterilizing, that they were never very good at stopping transmission. Now with the emergence of Omicron, it's quite clear they're not doing very much. Um, even Rochelle Walensky admitted that. And without that uh, sort of broader public health uh, justification or externalities as Professor Ghostin talks about, then what we're looking at is mandates that are about protecting the individual from him or herself. And I find those very troubling. Um, if the government or your employer can tell you to take a vaccine so that you don't uh, have a severe outcome from COVID, well, why can't they tell you to maintain a certain BMI? Obesity is the number one risk factor for COVID. And I hope that a lot of, a lot of people would see the problem with your employer or the government being able to force you to um, exercise or maintain a certain BMI so that to reduce worker absenteeism. Uh, I also find it ironic that it's the left who, who's embracing this idea um, when it's uh, this is turning the worker into a commodity who is basically just exists to service his or her employer and to, you know, um, be the most healthy that he or she can be uh, for that reason. Another difference between this vaccine mandate and others that have existed in the past is that um, in addition to not being sterilizing, is that it, the, the disease itself poses a very low risk to young people. And it's not at all clear that the risks of the vaccines are, um, are less than the risks of COVID, especially children, and especially COVID recovered children. These vaccine mandates don't take into account natural immunity, another reason that they're troubling. Um, most vaccine mandates in the past have. We've never mandated vaccines that have been around for less than two years. And so by definition, can't have been studied for long-term effects. The idea that, you know, there's, oh, this is, they're perfectly safe. The vaccines appear to be safe rel low overall, relatively. Um, but that doesn't mean that for every individual, there won't be side effects. And I, I talk to people who've experienced severe side effects from this vaccine and other vaccines. So to take choice out of the individual's hand, hands when the vaccine is not sterilizing, doesn't stop transmission, when it hasn't been around for even two years, when a lot of people have natural immunity and transmit COVID at lower rates than those who are only vaccinated, I find the whole, um, the whole concept to be deeply troubling, both from a legal and an ethical perspective. Uh, this has led to uh, the an ironic situation in many states where, uh, for instance, Rhode Island, California, because they've had to fire um, healthcare workers who won't get vaccinated, including ones who have natural immunity, they're actually permitting COVID positive healthcare workers, as long as they're vaccinated to treat patients. This is, this is the sort of insanity that results when people insist on a system of mandates that doesn't actually make any sense. And so for ethical, legal, and uh, public health reasons, it's important, in my opinion, to return to an era of informed consent to allow people to make choices in consultation with their doctors. It's best for everybody. It's best for public health. All right. Well, thank you all. Um, very, very great answers and you've covered a lot of ground. Um, so I, I think what I'm going to do um, is, you know, first kind of give Professor Gaston and Professor Hyman a chance to respond each to um, some of the points that Ms. Yunus made. Um, you know, I think um, some of the main points that we were discussing are, you know, the risks of side effects, um, things like natural immunity, should that be taken into account when we make exemptions? And, you know, how, how do these vaccines affect transmission? And, you know, does that change the validity of the vaccines if, if they don't actually stop transmission? So Professor Gaston, if you just want to take a chance to respond. Do I always have to be first? And it's, and it's I can go first if you want. And, and obviously it's two against one. There isn't like a middle. <laughs> so, um, okay. Um, we really should get our facts a bit clearer. That I'll just, so I'll just do the facts. Um, I don't know, I've never heard about this. I've never, I've never heard the, the expression sterilizing um, from vaccines, but um, that must be, that must be me. Um, the, uh, first of all, there's been opposition and I agree with David, you know, opposition to vaccines are on the left and the right. They're the, you know, the California suburbs and, you know, Whole Foods people, uh, as well as the right. That's absolutely clear. Um, but there's been, there was, uh, there was, um, objection to them when, uh, it was very clear that there was a significant reduction in transmission, um, you know, the original um, uh, messenger RNA vaccines, you know, had, you know, over 95% of uh, effectiveness against reinfection, against infection. Um, so there was, there it was clear. Um, it, it is true um, that with the Omicron variant, it's highly infectious, 
there are a lot of breakthrough infections and I, and I, and I would be less than honest if I said that I did, I mean, I have, I have sympathy with, with David's point um, that, that in this, in this wave, the justification for mandates has uh, ameliorated considerably because it's more of a protection of self rather than others. But nonetheless, they do impede transmission. Um, a person who's um, vaccinated, and if they're vaccinated and recovered even more so, um, uh, harbor the virus um, uh, and, and are infectious for shorter shorter um, periods of time. Um, and the chances of transmission are lower, but they're not, certainly not anywhere near zero. There are a lot of breakthrough infections. Um, that's um, very clear. Um, in terms of safety, these are enormously safe vaccines. Yes, they've only been here for a year, but there've been you know, billions upon billions of doses globally and in the United States. Um, this is, is one of the safest vaccines we've had and to suggest that it isn't or plant the seed of doubt that it isn't, um, I think is disingenuous. It's just, it's factually wrong and we need to be very clear about our facts. Um, in terms of long-term implications of uh, vaccination, um, there's an overwhelming scientific consensus that getting COVID has much um, uh, more far-reaching um, risks to the individual of longer-term consequences, something we call long COVID or post-COVID um, uh, 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 disease. The, 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 um, and so I think that that's really important. The other thing is, is that um, vaccinologists will tell you that long-term um, uh, uh, adverse effects from vaccines are vanishingly rare. You know, if you're going to see an adverse effect, you normally see it fairly soon, certainly within days, weeks, or even months. Um, and so uh, what I want to say is, is that, yes, I, I recognize that under the current wave um, with a very highly infectious pathogen that the um, that the justification is diminished but not completely um, changed, although there are externalities for hospitalizations and, and, and imposing healthcare costs on others. Um, and also making it more difficult for people with other diseases, cancer, diabetes, or needing other kinds of medical procedures to get the, the attention they need. Um, but I just wanted to clarify some of those facts. Um, uh, and I do recognize, so I do, I do um, concede that the, that the justification for an externality is diminished, but I don't think diminished, um, uh, uh, but I still think is, is present. Um, so continuing my mushy moderate position, uh, I, I want to agree with Larry that vaccines reduce transmission. Uh, and I want to agree with Janine that the justification that's tied to externalities is different than the justification that's tied to this will be good for you. Um, and by reducing the rate of hospitalization and mortality. Um, and those stand on different footings. And the challenge is uh, where do we draw the line when government starts telling you to do things that it's concluded are better for you. Uh, and Janine used you know, the example of uh, you should have an optimal BMI and we won't cover you presumably for health costs or consequences. If you exceed that, you can raise many of the same objections to wellness programs, uh, to surcharges that are tied to whether you smoke or not, uh, and so on and so on. And so I think we should be clear and open that we're doing some things, but not other things and make merits-based arguments as to why we think some of those are justified and others are not. I think the risk benefit calculus is exceptionally clear for elderly people with comorbidities. Um, I think it gets much harder uh, as you move lower in the population, uh, particularly for you know, people who are under 18 and especially for people who are under six or five. Uh, and so that's an area where we might uh, want to be considerably more cautious uh, in thinking about mandates, especially uh, as, you know, the risks of side effects of the vaccine, which there are, they're relatively rare, uh, but there are, um, 
can can be higher in people that have you know pre-existing cardiac issues that we ought to be paying attention to. Um, and that you know is the, the problem that the devil's using rules versus standards, right? A rule that says everybody must be vaccinated is clear to state, but it has real error costs, even though the decision costs are low. A rule that says let's start allowing various types of exemptions and enforcing them in good faith, uh, which it's not always clear that people are doing, uh, is a rule where fewer people are going to be vaccinated, but the mismatch problem of people who either don't think they need it or have legitimate, you know, religiously based or other based, uh, ethically based objections to getting them will be able to optimize along the whatever they think they ought to be. Um, so let me stop there because, uh, as I said earlier, law professors like to go on, and that's more than enough. Sure, and and I'll give um, I'll give Ms. Yunus a chance to respond. Thank you so much. Um, so a few things with respect to the transmission issue. Uh, there have been numerous studies that actually cast doubt on you know the degree to which people which the vaccines stop transmission, and that's been true all along. There was a study from Qatar. There was one from Wisconsin, and this was during Delta that confirmed that vaccinated individuals were at least as likely to shed virus as the unvaccinated. Um, there, there are yeah, other- but those, that, those that, are, those, excuse those, me, no, 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 right. it's not those your- Those data are just wrong. I mean, yes, you have those more- are, yes, right. It's right. not your turn. <laughs> so I, don't want, I don't want the audience to be confused. There are- On the facts. Any event, <laughs> in any event, why don't we move away from the transmission issue? Because your contention is also, I assume, that the vaccines are extremely effective at preventing severe disease in the individual who takes them. So then why do you need other people to take them? Look, and I'm not, I'm not anti-vaccine. I took the vaccine myself. I told my parents to get it. I just think that this approach is extremely detrimental to public health. I think that it's, it's, it has, it's unethical. And I don't, I think it's going to lead to um, a broader anti-vax movement in the long run, if one takes the long view in terms of externalities. So we have to look at things a little more, you know, people don't just behave the way you want. It's not that you say, go get the vaccine and everyone gets the vaccine and then the hospitals aren't overwhelmed. Actually, one of the reasons that hospitals are overwhelmed is because we've been firing healthcare workers who aren't getting the vaccine. So there's more to it than just looking at it in that simple way. Side effects, myocarditis are in, among young men. Now we're seeing much higher rates than we're first. First, it looked like one in a couple of million. Now it's looking at like one in a couple of thousand thousands. And this dismissal of myocarditis is not a serious uh, condition is actually wrong. It, lead, it can lead to scarring of the heart tissue and long-term effects that are unknown. As a cardiologist I speak to frequently named Anish Koka in Pennsylvania says, we simply don't know these young men could be dropping dead 20 years later. I am not trying to scare people from getting the vaccine. That's not my position. What my position is, is that taking choice out of the hands of the individual in consultation with his or her doctor is the wrong approach. And because there are individual circumstances that affect whether or not the vaccine is the right choice for one. A young man who had COVID last month, the vaccine may pose a greater risk than, uh, than not getting the vaccine. Um, and in fact, it probably, it does. And that is why I consider these mandates to be highly problematic. Well, thank you, Ms. Yunez. Um, so, you know, I think we, we can move forward to the um, discuss the specific mandates. Um, I'm sure you guys are all familiar with them. Do you think the courts are drawing principled lines when they say that Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services, um, that that mandate can go forward, but the OSHA one cannot? When they say that the military can go forward, but federal contractors cannot? Um, you know, what, what are your positions on those? So, Professor Hyman, we'll start with you this time. Um, well, the, you know, employees versus contractors goes back to the, one of the observations I made before, which is, you know, employers can specify the terms under which uh, you can remain employed. Uh, and, you know, the military, at least arguably, uh, you can impose stricter conditions on them and the government has, right? There have been various vaccines that military personnel have had to receive uh, on pain of separation. Uh, that we've never considered using for uh, civilian employees, let alone ordinary citizens. Uh, and so, you know, that matches on to a sort of longstanding set of rules. Uh, with respect to, you know, the contractors issue, it kind of involves the fair notice and express statutory authorization issues that I also alluded to. Uh, the difference between OSHA and CMS, uh, I think, 
has to do with the reality that, uh, at least for OSHA, if the bug is endemic, and I use bug in the shorthand form, it's obviously not a bacteria, it's a virus, it's not a workplace specific problem. And so it doesn't fit neatly into a statutory framework that's tied to workplace specific risks. You can obviously catch it in the workplace, but if you can catch it elsewhere, I think the court understandably viewed this as a circumvention strategy or a workaround on the otherwise significant limitations on the ability of the federal government to actually impose a broad-based mandate, the point, one of the points I, I made earlier. Uh, whereas the CMS issue, presumably it was some version of, well, it's hospitals, hospitals need to be safe. We had some broad language authorizing CMS to do things. That's enough to hang our hat on. There isn't the same mismatch problem that we have with OSHA. Um, and I guess the last point I want to make before we leave is the reason why we have a shortage of hospitals is not simply because some hospitals have been firing people that haven't gotten vaccines. It's because inpatient beds are really expensive and there's a long-term trend in decline in the number of inpatient beds in hospitals in the United States to the point that an ordinary flu season will basically bump us close to or above our capacity. And then when you have something like COVID that is much more pervasive, you're gonna have that problem, right? But when your census rate is running pretty close to full ordinarily, it doesn't take much to bump you over the top. Okay. Well, thank you. Um, uh, Ms. Yunez, I'll let you go next. Um, sure. Well, I suppose it'll come as no surprise that I uh, think the court re reached the wrong conclusion on the healthcare workers, but the right conclusion on the OSHA statute. Um, I, I do understand the line that the court drew, and it had a lot to do with, you know, working around vulnerable people. I would have at least um, hoped that the court would accept uh, uh, healthcare workers with naturally acquired immunity from that. Um, based on the OSHA case, I expect that the uh, contractor case will be struck down. I think that the basis for that mandate is even more tenuous than the OSHA one because the, that's based on a statute that's about procurement of government contracts. Uh, it's not even about health and safety. So I think that that one basically is uh, completely, I mean, I don't think there's a strong argument at all uh, for that one, although I didn't think that for the OSHA case either. Federal employees uh, it has been stayed and by a court in Texas. Um, I actually worked on a case in front of the same judge, same issues. <laughs> Timing ended up with the other uh, the other firm getting the stay, but uh, I don't think that the federal employee statute permits for that mandate either. Um, again, I, I simply don't think that the federal government should be in the business of uh, mandating vaccines at all. I think that far exceeds its authority. Um, and just uh, one more comment on the, the hospitalization <laughs> issue. I agree with Professor Hyman about that. Um, and I do understand that hospitals being overwhelmed is a problem, but again, the question is how is, what is the best way to prevent that, uh, that issue or that circumstance and vaccine mandates do not seem to be the way to do that. All right. Well, thank you, Professor Gostin. Well, I mean, I guess suppose that it depends upon whether you, what your view is, is about whether vaccine mandates expand the number of people who are vaccinated or they don't. But it's very clear that, you know, one way of reducing um, uh, capacity issues in hospitals is by uh, vaccinating a higher rate of the population. Um, the, the, uh, the U.S. Uh, hospitalization and death rate, even through Omicron, is much higher than similarly situated countries because they have much higher levels of, of immunization. And there's you know, very strong data showing that people who are unvaccinated have you know, far higher risks of, of being hospitalized if they get COVID than, than, than others do. So um, in terms of the um, federal mandates, I, I just put in the chat a JAMA article where we discuss these two cases. You know, I you know, I, I, I flip completely. I basically think CMS was rightly decided and OSHA wrongly decided. But, you know, I'm not, uh, I think it's, these are genuinely debatable issues. I don't think that there is kind of a, you know, a moral or jurisprudential high road here. Um, uh, and I'm not that concerned, at least not overly concerned about 
um, what the what the OSHA decision will mean for future federal vaccine mandates. I, I absolutely agree that most mandates should be at the uh, state and local level and that um, the federal government shouldn't really be in the business um, of uh, requiring vaccines unless it's real emergency, which I think we're in now and we have been, um, except perhaps, you know, in, at the border, you know, trying to, you know, require people to be vaccinated to enter the United States, things like that. I do worry much more about uh, what that OSHA decision um, uh, portends for the future of federal regulation, um, particularly in the area of, you know, environmental regulation. Um, because uh, if 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 it were true that um, every time that there is a significant regulation that affects um, you know, major economic and social consequences in the United States, if it were true that you'd always need to have very specific congressional authorization for that, it would really um, disempower federal agencies from acting flexibly and nimbly to, to protect the American public. And I think no more, we, we, the, the biggest worry that I have is in areas of very high consequence like environmental protection that it could um, eviscerate um, uh, the federal government's role to protect public health and safety um, going forward. Well, thank you. Um, I think you know you touched on some some important points about the future and and how what we do now affects you know what we do later. And I want to give a chance to um, Professor Hyman and Ms. Yunus to kind of discuss what you think will happen in the future and how you think we're setting the stage for, uh, or what you think we're setting the stage for now. So, uh, Professor Hyman, if you want to go next. Uh, let me let Janine go first, because she and Larry are at loggerheads, and I don't want to be stuck in the middle. <laughs> I mean, I don't mind if you want to go first, <laughs> but frankly, uh, um, agencies having far less power is, uh, in, in my opinion, one of the best things that could happen to this country. And frankly, if the last two years are any indication, they've just been running roughshod over people's civil liberties with no regard for them whatsoever. Um, you know, the CDC eviction moratorium, which is a complete um, misuse of the CDC's authority, uh, these attempts at these vaccine mandates, uh, I mean, these have real consequences for people's lives. And there's, there's, there's more than COVID in the world. And people's lives have been devastated by lockdowns, by um, these agencies. The, the CDC and the FDA have far too much authority. They haven't been acknowledging the real science, They, especially when it comes to natural immunity and various other aspects of this situation. Um, in any event, that's that's my position on OSHA or on uh, the agencies. Um, but I actually forgot what I was supposed to be talking about. Oh, the future. Um, <laughs> The future, I don't, well, uh, I mean, it was a good decision. I don't really know. Obviously it's a conservative court, so it's like they're likely to be, you know, more such decisions in the future. Um, hopefully they'll be reining in agencies' powers. Hopefully Americans have seen um, that they shouldn't really be trusting agencies this way. The blind reliance on CDC guidance, which is not law, um, has, has been extremely detrimental to this um, country, to public health policy. Um, and uh, I've seen across the country, universities and employers just adopting CDC guidance as though it's the word of God when, um, you know, it's not subject to lawmaking. It's not, sub it's not subject to the input of various people with different perspectives. Um, it's, it's, it's based on the uh, views of people who, frankly, in my opinion, tend to have a rather myopic worldview. Um, they're sort of looking at one thing without regard to people's overall mental and physical well-being. So let me actually start with the last point you need made, right, which is the public health people understandably focused on public health concerns uh, in the same way that the DOD focuses on defense concerns and the EPA focuses on environmental concerns. The difficulty, of course, uh, is you get tunnel vision and a fixation on uh, one particular domain, and you don't think about all of the collateral costs uh, that are resulting from this monomaniacal fixation on a particular issue. This is a problem that agencies run into over and over again. Um, and part of the role of Congress uh, is to give them enough power 
uh, to address the problems without so much power uh, that they run roughshod uh, in pursuit of their self-declared mission. And you know, you, you've got examples of this across administrations and across agencies that I think are, are a cautionary table. Um, second, uh, Churchill said experts should be on tap, not on top. Uh, that is, they should be available to provide information because the median member of Congress probably took science in high school. Um, they certainly are unlikely to have majored in it in college. Uh, and although there are a couple of physicians uh, in Congress, um, they decided to do something else rather than focus on, you know, the subtleties of dealing with the latest pandemic or whatever other problem we have to deal with. And so it's critical that they have access to good information, but they shouldn't, you know, just defer to agency personnel in any given area on their recommendations. They need to think about the trade-off across domains. Uh, and then finally, Courtney asked for predictions about the future. Um, and so I give you Yogi Berra. It's difficult to make predictions, especially about the future. And so I won't. <laughs> That's totally fair. And that's a, that's a good note to begin our q and I know Professor Gostin has to head out a little bit early. Um, so, you know, we'll, when you're ready, you can head out and we'll miss you. Um, Thank you. Um, let's see. So I, if people want to submit questions to the Q&A, um, they'll show up to me and I'll ask them for you. Um, I will start off with a question um, for Ms. Yunez from Uriel Charlap. Um, let us assume for the sake of discussion that the vaccine prevents transmission um, the data that the vaccine prevents transmission will be found. Would you be in favor of a mandate? That's a good question. Um, if all other characteristics of the virus were the same, I would uh, say no. Um, because the vaccine only poses a risk pretty much to a specific portion of the population, I think that it's immoral uh, and bad public health policy, again, to mandate it for everybody. Um, I would actually said on Twitter the other day, and I sort of regretted it, that, you know, take the hypothetical if you have a, this is Ebola and we have a sterilizing vaccine that stops trans transmission um, and it, it sort of kills everybody regardless of age or other uh, characteristics. I could imagine um, being in favor of mandates in such a situation, but on the other hand, they wouldn't be necessary because everybody would be running out to get the vaccine unless the government has lost the trust of the people and they don't you know, believe the facts that are coming out of the, the government or various agencies. And that's a separate problem. So I would say, I, I tend to think that if you need mandates, there's a pro bigger problem. You have a bigger problem on your hands. The people don't trust the government and that's something that should be dealt with separately. Professor? Professor Hyman? Um, I don't have a dog in that fight unless you want me to answer the question. Um, That's fair. Um, no, okay. We got a lot of questions, so <laughs> maybe we should yeah, sure. alternate and focus on the ones where there's profound disagreement, if that's okay. <laughs> I don't think we have that much disagreement. Yeah, so that's going to be. Um, give, give me time, Janine. I'll come up with something. Sure. Um, so we have a number of questions. Um, so Nathan Frankenberger, um, he asks, he says, I work in radiology and COVID units, et cetera. I did time in the military as well. I spent roughly 17 years building a career. There is zero liability if I were to have a stroke and become disabled. Also, Professor Gosson should review risk analysis. Assuming people are vectors is ridiculous. Okay, well, I guess he's not here right now. So um, I will move on from that question. Um, so no, I, I, just to be, I'm not sure that, this question is correct that there's zero liability if you have a stroke and become disabled. If it's the result of exposure at work, uh, you can't sue the vaccine company for that. Um, but workers' comp would cover you, assuming you're a statutory employee, which is going to vary depending upon your state. Um, and you'd be covered by Social Security if you become disabled. Um, you know, we can argue about whether liability protections for vaccine development are a good or a bad decision. Um, and, you know, I've done a lot of work on medical malpractice. We have a vaccine compensation fund uh, because these cases um, don't fit so neatly into a medical malpractice model. Uh, and I, I certainly, you know, the vaccine compensation fund is a government program. I'm not going to suggest that it works flawlessly. Um, but we haven't just left people to their own devices uh, when 
they suffer injury as a result of you know, employment uh, or receiving a vaccine. You know, I mean, if you, a lot of this also just to give people a little bit of history goes back to the swine flu epidemic um, where uh, I know this is, goes beyond living memory of some, at least a significant chunk of the people on the call, but way back in the 1970s, we had disco uh, and we also had uh, concerns about a swine flu epidemic. Uh, and so a lot of people got vaccinated, but the rates of injury were, um, were strikingly high. Uh, and so we end up with a vaccine compensation fund, but the vaccine manufacturer said never again. We're not in this business unless you immunize us from liability. Uh, and you know you can think about this as just a variant of the public goods problem. If the liability risks are too high, something that's immensely valuable is not gonna get created, even though when push comes to shove, we actually kind of sort of really need it. Well, thank you very much. Um, Ms. Yunus, do you have a response to that or would you like me to move forward? Um, no, I, I'm fine. <laughs> All right, so the next question comes from John Overing. He's a 2L at Georgetown. Um, and he asks, given that viruses vary tremendously in spread and severity, how big of a public health risk is necessary to mandate vaccines? Um, you know, this is the sort of eye of the beholder issue um, where uh, federalism comes to the rescue, right? Some states are full of risk averse people. Other states are full of people who are willing to roll the dice. Um, and you can pick whichever state you want to put into that box, but Nevada and Arizona are likely to be, you know, more likely in the latter group than in the former group. And, you know, you can, uh, other states are going to just going to make a different judgment on these sorts of issues. So uh, I think, you know, the parameters that people should pay attention to are straightforward. It's infectiousness and severity, right? The higher you are on both of those, uh, the more you want to start to think about this is a real externality problem um, rather than just uh, anybody with any sacho would get the vaccination. Janine, well, I keep provoking you, but I'm not <laughs> responding. I'll sort of reiterate my earlier response was, which is, you know, I do think that uh, if that people are fairly rational when it comes to these things and they'll take the vaccine voluntarily if it's you know when you have the right balance of infectiousness and deadliness that max that mandates shouldn't be necessary i i acknowledge that there could be situations in which um you know they are i don't i don't know exactly what the recipe is but okay great um and our next question comes from um from an anonymous attendee and this anonymous attendee asks, what are your opinions on prophylaxis medications as an alternative to the vaccine? As an individual who had an adverse reaction to the first dose, I've had a difficult time seeking out alternatives to protect myself because we know very few masks are effective. There have been numerous studies on both ivermectin and hydrochloroquine, so I'd love to hear your opinion on those. George Shell Law 1L. Ms. Yunus, you can start first. Oh, people love to talk about it. <laughs> I, you know, I'm not a, I'm not a medical professional. I've studied the vaccines extensively because it's sort of the nature of my job. I haven't looked into those and I'm a little bit uncomfortable weighing in on it, to be honest. Okay. Um, I would not suggest taking either of them prophylactically. It's a separate question whether they're useful to take if you've been exposed. Um, and I'm not going to try and characterize the literature on it, partly because I'll get hate mail from either side, regardless of what I say. Um, this is another of those areas where, you know, they either work or they don't, and your political priors about whether there's a conspiracy to suppress it, uh, or people should not be taking horse dewormer, are frankly irrelevant to the empirical question. Um, so, you know, as far as masks, um, I think a well-fitted, uh, effective N95 mask, uh, is in theory a great solution. In practice, people use them wrong. They take them off. They are not fitted properly. Uh, you know, in some ways, it's similar to this, the gap uh, between contraception and its theoretical effectiveness versus its in-use effectiveness. Uh, human beings are not that good at wearing things on their faces for that long, uh, and. It, you know, everybody can go on the web and see pictures of people 
uh, with uh, wheels and other uh, markings from wearing too tight a mask. Uh, so, sorry. sorry, go ahead. <laughs> no, no, I missed, I didn't hear masks in there because that I do have a strong opinion on and I have read extensively, I think they- <laughs> the, Yeah, they <laughs> keep poking at you, hoping no, no. for the reaction. No, no, the, the community masking is a nonsense idea. I mean, if even if in theory, I, I mean, I pretty much agree with what Professor Hyman said, even if, you know, in theory and 90, you know, whatever fit tested N95 works, it's not realistic to expect people to go about their daily lives or desirable um, wearing these all the time, certainly not for children. Even medical professionals say that they're suffocating, that they're extremely uncomfortable. This is not the way that we should be going, um, you know, and frankly, we should just be done with all mask mandates, in my opinion. Okay, um, and this question comes from Patrick Bailey, um, a Georgetown University student, and he asks, if the federal government mandates medical procedures that would otherwise require informed consent, where's the line between that and what the state of Virginia did in Buck v. Bell? Uh, Ms. Yunus? Um, well, exactly. <laughs> That's one of the arguments I would be raising if we had gotten to Jacobson. Um, I mean, Buck versus Bell permits the... Uh, I mean, one of the differences, of course, is that that doesn't involve externalities or as vaccine mandates do. Um, but yes, the state should not be in the business of mandating medical procedures for the most part. That's that's and this is one of the reasons. And I think actually Buck shows just how wrong that can go. Uh, I think we think of it as a different era, something that wouldn't happen now. But I don't think that's at all evident, especially with what we're looking at with the vaccines. I mean, I talked to, uh, you know, dozens of people a week at least if not more and I, I hear some really crazy stories i'm people who had a, a young woman i spoke to who almost died from the flu vaccine and her uh employer was still forcing her to get the covid vaccine even though he had written a note saying that she really shouldn't uh he really was concerned about it so now you have you know administrators at a at someone's job are overriding a medical professional's opinion it's based on an individual's assessment of that person's medical history. And it's very troubling. And I think, you know, that's the territory we're finding ourselves in. People really being really scared for, for valid reasons and having to choose between just uh, taking the risk and losing their jobs. So just for those who are not uh, up to speed with uh, Supreme Court precedents, Buck v. Bell is obviously about the constitutional permissibility of forced sterilization. Uh, usually of, uh, not surprisingly, uh, people on the margins of society, as well as um, the, relatively speaking, disenfranchised. Um, and for those of you who think it was ancient history, the state of California was still sterilizing people into the early 1960s. Um, so th this is not, you know, I, I think we should be cautious in the analogies we use. I don't think vaccines uh, are of a piece necessarily with forced sterilization without consent um, for all sorts of obvious reasons. Uh, but even leaving that aside, I think the question you should ask is, well, if you think forced sterilization is on one side and vaccinations on the other side, where in the middle are you drawing the line and what's the justification for where you draw that particular line? And that's without even taking account uh, to the, I think, very sensible uh, observations Janine has made about variation, right? Uh, it, patients come in lots of variations. Uh, they have different pre-existing conditions. They have different concerns. They had different prior reactions. Um, the flip side of that is everybody's going to have a doctor's note uh, if that's enough to get you out of a vaccination. And that was, frankly, the problem when states started allowing uh, moral objections to vaccination of children. Um, that kind of turbocharged uh, the drop in vaccination rates, which is why you see diseases recurring that we never used to see. Certainly not, you know, when I was back in medical school, they had basically been wiped out, but now they're back uh, because moms are concerned about autism and reluctant to vaccinate their kids. That's a tragedy as well. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, so this will probably be our last question. We're coming up on 5.30. Um, so this is from Molly Hogan. 
She asks, since you both have noted what public health, uh, the public health authorities have lost the trust of the public, what, if anything, do you think they can do to regain that trust? Do you see potential concerns for trickle down effects of vaccine skepticism for things like traditional childhood vaccines? Well, it sounds like potentially, yes, Professor Hyman, but, um, but what do you think that the agencies can do to regain the public trust? If you want to start, Professor. Okay. <laughs> Either one. Um, so I think, first of all, to that last point, yes, that's what's happening. I mean, I'm uh, very involved in this movement. So I speak to a lot of people who are against the vaccine mandates that come from all stripes. And there are a lot of people I talk to who never doubted vaccines who are now starting to look at all the vaccines. So I think, as I said earlier, I, I believe that unfortunately, this is the coercion involved here is going to spur a broader uh, anti-vaccine movement that's going to have long-term detrimental effects. As for what can be done, well, I, I think it's going to take a lot for agencies like the CDC and the FDA to get the public's trust back. Um, the denial of natural immunity, I think, has been one of the most disturbing things. Uh, there has been study after study that shows vac uh, sorry, natural immunity is actually better than the vaccines. Um, and the, it's the way that the CDC has tried to frame it and tried to claim that anyway, you should get the vaccine because it might lead to a minor bump in antibodies, which doesn't necessarily even translate into a clinical benefit, which means that it might raise your antibody levels a little bit. It doesn't necessarily show that you're less likely to get sick or very sick or transmit the disease. Um, the, that denial has led to a massive breakdown in trust, I would say. So being more transparent, being more honest, instead of looking like you have an, a, an, an agenda, I mean, people rightly see the CDC as having a vaccinate everybody agenda without regard to personal circumstances or any other uh, type of, you know, um, any, any other factors that come into play. Uh, so, but I think it's going to be a long road back to that, and it's too bad. Um, gee, I've only got a minute, right? Um, so there's a, a former uh, head of the Canadian uh, equivalent of the Federal Reserve who said, trust arrives on foot and leaves in a Maserati, right? Once people conclude that you behave badly, they're going to be very reluctant to trust you again. And so it's going to be a long path to rebuild trust. That includes being more modest about what you actually know. Uh, and more modest about what you can say, right? Rather than viewing this as a messaging problem, uh, I think you need to view it as a competence problem as well as a confidence problem. Uh, and I talk more about that in the piece that uh, I mentioned earlier about government failure and COVID. I, I think, and it's not just the CDC, this is, uh, COVID is a master class in government failure. It's one of these, everywhere you look, you see problems and things that you thought were being handled and were the core competencies of those respective agencies. And if, you know, the reason we delegate authority is because of expertise, they haven't done so well by that criteria. And so they ought to focus on the reasons why they exist and do a better job on those core competencies. All right. Well, thank you both very much. Um, it's been wonderful having you here today. It was a lot of fun. Um, and we had heard a lot of great, great points on both sides. So um, thank you. And I hope you have a great rest of your week. Thanks thank much. You. Thank you Bye so now. much.